and welcome to the podcast, An Intelligent Look at Terrorism. I'm your host, Phil Gursky, President and CEO of Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting in Ottawa, Canada. Have you ever found yourself in a relationship where eventually you weren't quite too sure about what your partner was up to and then got to the point where you decided, hmm, I don't want to be part of this anymore. This is going down a pathway that I don't like. Well, I'm really pleased to be joined today by uh, a guest who has agreed to talk to me about this particular issue. Her name is Deborah. I'm not using her last name at her own request. Uh, she was raised as a Mennonite here in Canada. She left her faith, married a radical Muslim, joined Hizbut Tahrir, which we're going to talk a lot about today, was joined by a second wife, and then she finally decided that she wanted out of this. And so she has basically, uh, she's left her husband. She's left this world of Islamist extremism, which again, we're going to get into in, in, in a lot of detail. But first and foremost, I want to say, Deborah, thanks very much for joining me on the podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me. So first questions first. What was it, uh, again, as, as, as much as you feel comfortable, what was it that led your, your decision to leave Mennonite, which is a fundamentalist Christian faith, I think we could agree on that, and right. to uh, <clears throat> to embrace Islam. What, how, what was that journey like? I guess it's like a super long story, um, but um, in a nutshell, I had gone to Bible college after high school just for a year, but um, really studying like or wanting to learn about like how the entire Bible was put together. And as I learned how much, you know, humans' hands actually got involved in it, um, it was something I kind of more started doubting and just seeking other things. And after a few years of that, I had met uh, my ex who was very active Muslim in a political scene. And that's when I started looking into what Islam is. Now, the thing with uh, Islam is that it's very close to like a fundamental uh, Christian type of faith where you um, you wear specific clothing and you, you know, like there's just everything dictated to you. It's more like a whole life decision. So it was an easy thing to transition into. So someone and like yourself of, who came from a, a, a fairly fundamentalist Christian background, you're, it'd, be, it'd be an equally fundamentalist kind of rule governed. You kind of know right from the get go what you're getting into then. Right, exactly. It's it's not like a huge stretch. The difference was, uh, I mean, the Quran to me, it seemed to be a lot more authentic. So it was something that, you know, just seemed, I don't know, just, uh, I guess, just more authentic to me than the Bible did. So I guess also the fact that this particular group of Muslims, they're so um, well educated and politically active in the current scene. So you're now like... It's not just like a spiritual religion. You're like using it in your everyday life, more like an ideology. So I guess it was just more legit in my eyes. So your ex-husband, I guess, and the people with whom he was, as you say, politically active, would have uh, quite encouraged you to go down this pathway to rescind your former Christian beliefs and to adopt Muslim beliefs. Is that an accurate portrayal? Right. Yeah, I had already like rejected the Christian like faith system so it was like an easy thing like they were you know most um converts that i had met and there's quite a few converts um that i was introduced uh to initially all had kind of left similar idea uh, things like a similar religious background of like christian or even like sikh backgrounds like just different fundamental things it's just like an, another shift i guess so in other words, you didn't feel like coerced or this wasn't a difficult transition for you then, looking in hindsight? No, I remember initially it was, it just felt pretty easy. It was something you kind of grow up with. To me, it was just like I was kind of going back to my roots almost, like my you know great grandparents would have been like very pious and practicing like that. Okay. Now, you have mentioned on, on a few occasions that your ex-husband is what you called politically active. Can you go a little more into detail as to what, mean, what you mean by that? Well, I mean, his Terrier is actually a political party that advocates that Islam isn't a religion. They really propagate that it's straight up an ideology with a set of uh, laws, just like any other ideology. Um, so you now take the spirituality out of it and it becomes more just like a cerebral intellectual debate and you're looking at the world 
more like a chessboard and you're looking at like the history of the conquests of everything from their perspective from the Middle Eastern side of things so now you're starting to reject all the history that you were taught in school and you're now learning about what actually happened to the Muslims so you can really see how converts especially become radicalized and want to kind of help the cause because they now start to change their entire concept about world history and um, basically, you know, we're on the wrong side of history. Like, you know, the whole like white guilt, that's like really mm-hmm. prevalent. Which we're seeing a lot these days, of course, on a whole oh, number, number yes, of fronts. Much more <laughs> amplified. Right. Before, before I go on and, and uh, ask you more about your husband's role with Hizbut Tahrir, just for my listeners for whom maybe Hizbut Tahrir is, uh, is new to you, uh, so it is a, a political party. It's been around since about the 1950s. I believe it started in Jordan. Uh, and as Deborah says, it really is a, it's a political party that wants to take Islam and infuse it into not just your spiritual religious life, but the political life. What's interesting is that a, a number of countries, largely in Central Asia, uh, have listed Hizbut Tahrir as a terrorist group. Now, we here in Canada have not. Hizbut Tahrir is not one of the 56 or 62 groups that Public Safety Canada has listed as a terrorist group. But I can I can share with you that, I, that when I worked for CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, uh, we did in fact take a look at this group to see exactly what they were about, to see if there were aspects of it which were of concern to us from a violent perspective. So just to remind you that CSIS can have the authority to do these investigations, and this would have been in keeping with what we call Section 2C of the CSIS Act, which is political, religious, or ideological violence. And uh, without sharing too much in terms of state secrets, I think our conclusion at the time was that they didn't warrant that kind of attention. But I want to hear more of what Deborah thinks. So your husband is big in Tisba Tahrir. What kinds of activities do you remember him being involved in with HUT? Um, yeah, so initially, uh, when I first met him, they uh, were very active in the local universities and colleges, um, wherever there would be a Muslim student association where either a member was uh, attending that university or they would recruit somebody from that university so they would get kind of a foothold there and do like a weekly study group for the people to get them introduced to the group. Um, the the goal is, is that youth and university students are, I guess, the best candidates. Um, mm-hmm. They're easily recruited. Usually they're pretty upset about the political situation and want to do something about it. So I find that the approach of the HIZB, um is so intellectual that you really attract a lot of the university students. So as a as an Islamist group, then they, they as you said, they do target people that are educated because it's a, it's kind of a sophisticated argument, right? So with what you just said, they would actually go to campuses across Canada or across Ontario. I'm not sure how widespread it was and try to, I, I think infiltrate is probably too strong a word, but they would try to, as you say, gain a toehold and thereby gain some influence on the direction of the local MSA, Muslim Student Association, and to push it in a direction that would be more fertile or more in keeping with the HUT ideology. Is that a fair statement to make? Yeah, that's that's about right. They also did that with uh, some mosques trying to um, attain like a weekly study group in different mosques just to get um, involved into different communities, um, working in different Islamic schools as like just different, you know, teachers and leaders. And they seem to keep that a secret from the schools because usually the um, Muslim population of any city that I've come across don't like um, this group. Oh, really? Did you you get any insight as to why they did like them, Deborah? Well, they don't like the attention. They don't like, usually on Friday prayers, they give out leaflets. They hand out leaflets to all the people that attend and uh, advocate what they're doing and get people to join. And I guess they just, also that HT um, advocates not to get involved in government and not to vote. So when, Mm -hmm. you know, the local mosque, they're trying to, you know, (laughs) stay open. They don't want to have a group like this. Right, because you know, of course, yeah, because local mosques would want people to basically become part of the Canadian system, albeit while keeping exactly. their own Islamic faith. And here you have a group that says, 
don't be part of the system don't vote don't don't exercise your democratic right don't try to contribute to the, the society which you're living in, in this case Canada and this is why you think that most of the elders and or leaders of the either the mosques or whatever would push back against HUT which is why you, as you stated they would try to do so in secret and not let people know what they're up to right exactly so we have an organization that is clearly political in nature and as I said in some countries they some governments have elected to list them as a terrorist group from your perspective, Deborah, what do you think the danger was in allowing uh, HT to have this presence both on campuses and within Muslim communities here in Canada? What was it that worried you about the direction they were headed in? One thing, uh, even though I was like part of it and I was, you know, working with everyone, I didn't like the nature of the way they would kind of secretly do things, and um, they would stage like gatherings um, and invite prominent uh, people and then kind of almost like corner them so that they can question them like in in a public setting the, their whole goal is to really just account all the leaders like they really want to go to anybody who's of influence to the Muslims and uh, correct them or change their views or you know try to especially with here in canada i mean every most muslims are immigrants right and the immigrant population gets really upset when you tell them not to participate in the country right. system so now, there's a lot of pushback and a lot of debate when you say they were trying to kind of gain influence within the community was that influence was it targeted solely against muslim leaders or were they trying to basically recruit and you know, keep in the corral non-Muslim leaders like you know, municipal leaders or provincial leaders as well, or did you not experience that? No, uh, the thing is they really reject anybody that tries to work in the system. So um, immediately you're counted as like, you know, you've sold out basically. So if you try to go and become part of government or even like become a police officer, like you're now part of the system and that's, you've corrupted yourself now. Most um, HT members like won't even let you become part of any sort of government agency. And uh, so for them, it's all about, you know, basically telling the Muslims like, no, don't get comfortable here. We need our Islamic State and kind of like addressing that and making them aware that they need to work towards that. <clears throat> so as you're saying, they very much push back against integration. And I completely agree with you. The first thing that most immigrants want to do is to integrate. They don't want to feel like immigrants. They want to become part of right. society. They want to be accepted. They want to grow as part of this new community. What do you think then was the end goal of this organization, which sought to prevent that from happening? to prevent new immigrants, new Muslim immigrants from becoming true Canadians. What what do they want to do with this in the end, aside from create this Islamic State? But, I mean, surely they didn't think they could create Islamic State here in Canada, did they? No, that's not really, like, they're not trying to, like, start an Islamic State here. They have a very uh, well-planned out method of how to uh, reestablish the Islamic State according to the way the Prophet Muhammad did it. Um, so they analyzed it as in a spreading of ideas as what's happening. And hopefully, it eventually it gets to a point where you now um, are really, they always try to get influential people. So especially if they're in a Muslim country, they try to get like leaders of the armies. Right. So when you get an army to agree with you, then you can stage a full like military coup and then take over a government. So that is really their whole you know, end goal of how to establish it, then you'll have a full on Islamic state where every uh, member of uh, his book career has, like is obligated to wherever they are in the world, pick up and move straight to wherever that is. And now you like, it's just like ISIS. Now you have every, every Sharia law is implemented. So it's like, you know, they brought it out about throughout with nonviolence, but once it's established, it's your same Islamic state. Okay. Everyone else, has, you know. Were you ever um, faced with or nervous about acts of violence that might be used or any co any violent coercion that would be used to attain this goal on behalf of Hizbut Tahrir here in Canada? Not that I know of. Um, they try to... Uh, 
you know, stay on the side of the whole nonviolent aspect of thing. Now, we've had um, members leave and that are frustrated with the method as they're taking too long and you're not being effective by just talking. And then they move on to like a more jihadi group. Oh, really? So they have, um, like, especially in the UK, uh, HT is much bigger. And uh, they've been called uh, conveyor belt yes. to uh, larger tier. Because really, the culturing of the hizzo, you're becoming like, extremely aware of every single thing that's happening to every Muslim in the, you know. And so you really get fired up and you want to do something. So these youth, especially the young men that I, I came across, they would just they would get too impatient and want to do something right let's get let's get on with it this, this all this is just talk 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 we exactly. want, we want action okay yeah so at what point did it did, did, did the light bulb come on for you or the realization that hmm i don't like what i'm seeing here and i don't think i want to be part of it anymore can you walk us through sort of that process that you went through um sure um i was pretty run down by the end of it um we're, I mean, the ultimate goal, like I said, like we kind of had to always have that in the back of our head that we might have to just drop everything, sell everything and move to a Hilafa, an Islamic state somewhere. That terrified me. I, I was to a point where I was almost having nervous breakdowns, like scared because I have like, I had four children already and um, I couldn't imagine like picking up and taking them. And then I was seeing stories of people like moving to the Islamic state and with their kids, like, you know, and they're all like dying or whatever. And I guess it just got to a point where I just started kind of reaching out for help and people started helping me. And, um, you, you don't see it when you're like really in it. And it's been a, a few years of real like deprogramming and when you come out of it you realize how much of like a cult type uh, mentality it is because it's like a full-on brainwashing campaign on how like you're taught how to think and what to think about every single event so you don't really see uh, the world anymore like everyone else does. Now, you said you reached out to people and they were uh, quite willing to help you. Can you, without going into too, too many details, can you give us a sense as to who in your um, environment or who in your circle of friends was able to help you in this regard? Um, I had a couple of friends who had been converts as well, but they had kind of left. Uh, but they, most of the people I knew were concerned about my situation because it was like quite extreme and uh i mean with the polygamy and um having to hide it from people uh, so when i they they were almost like waiting for me to like give them the go ahead like try, give me some help or help me out of this and um and then when you reach out you realize um i mean the women's shelter and all of the social work um, social workers are out there they've seen my story many times so i'm, I'm st i was starting to see that this is like not an uncommon thing as well looking back deborah and looking forward are you surprised that more Canadians don't know about Hizbut Tahrir's activities? And do you think Canadians are sort of sleepwalking into a situation where we're going to look back and say, hmm, we probably shouldn't have allowed this to happen as long as it did. We should have taken action before. Do you feel that way right now? I do. I find that almost everybody around is, is very frustrated that these type of things are going on just, you know, without any... Under our like, noses issues yeah exactly i mean like um we went to a, a university in hamilton to do a talk about um syria and the whole like war there and um there was people like uh, i think the police had to come and protect or guard us so that we could actually put on this function there which was <laughs> advocating for an islamic state in the university it was like really crazy wow actual pr police yeah. protection wow 
yeah there was like police staying there and we're like why are they here and then some of us were thinking well maybe they're here to get rid of us and then we found out no no no, they're here to like protect and make sure we're able to do the whole function without any problems <laughs> like, so so now that you've you successfully extricated yourself from the situation um what do you think it needs to be done right now? And, and more importantly, you know, what have you elected to do with your life to try to bring more attention to this issue? I've decided uh, I wanted to like write a book uh, about the situation that I'm going through, kind of. Um, I have a lot of friends and uh, friends of friends that are, have gone through very similar things like this. And nobody's able to speak up. Most women are scared to speak up. I mean, I'm a little afraid for any repercussions i don't know how ht reacts to people speaking out against them because i don't know anybody that does that so are you, are you afraid for your own safety at any point deborah um yeah i mean as an apostate if you leave the religion and especially when you know that the group that you came from believes every sharia law that's um that there is you know what they think <clears throat> i don't know I, I find that the convert populations quite uh fundamental usually so it's hard to um it's hard to know well i mean kudos to you for telling your story kudos to you for taking the time to speak with me i understand you've done this with a few people uh, i really do appreciate the fact that you you've put yourself out there and, and, and you know shared with us some of the details as i said earlier uh, i've always seen hizbut tahrir uh, not necessarily uh, as a as a terrorist group because i couldn't find that kind of link to actual violent action but i think i would agree with you that from a civil integration and a why can't we all just get along perspective i would agree with other countries that have stated we don't really we don't really don't want his here they're not representative of the general muslim community and they do advocate things that are clearly against anyone who wants to live in a liberal de democratic society where, where freedom of choice is is there so again i i just want to thank you very very much for for sharing your story with me oh yeah no problem thank you and i, and I wish you all the best and if I, I hope you write a book, uh, and I, I, I'd love to read it, and I'd love for you to sign it for me one day. Oh, thank you. That would be great. So that was my conversation with Deborah. Uh, I'm just curious what you think about Hizbut Tahrir, if you have any kind of experience with them, or you've read anything about them. You can certainly reach me on Gmail, borealisrisk at gmail.com, or on Twitter at borealisaves. You'll also find me on LinkedIn and on Facebook. If you want to subscribe to all the content that I produce, so the podcast, the blogs, etc., please go to my website, www.borealisthreatenedrisk.com. Hit the subscribe button, fill in your information. You'll get a, a free daily digest every morning, podcast, blogs, the whole kit caboodle to your inbox every day. I'd love to hear what you think of my talk with Deborah or all the things that I put on my website, as well as some ideas for future content. I'll talk to you again very, very soon. Until then, stay safe. <laughs>